My earliest memories of hair aren't memories at all, but photographs that have become memories. My mother and father had four girls. I was girl number two. In the 50s, if a girl was born without hair, the only option was putting a bonnet on the child until she looked like a girl. <laughs> there were no precious pink headbands embellished with flowers made from tulle, satin ribbon, and pearl buttons. In my family, hair was not an issue. My sisters and I were born with hair, so my mother did what mothers did in the 50s. She bought a container of thick pink gel and used her own fingertips to fashion my fine hair into a gentle swell on the top of my head, pre-Elvis Presley and way cuter. <laughs> By the time I was four or five, my swell had grown into long, thick locks that could be coaxed into banana curls. Every Saturday night, my mother was all business as she wrapped the gel doused strands of hair sideways around each pink, spongy curler until clipping the pseudo sausages close to our heads. The lumpy night's sleep was worth the anticipation of bountiful curls the next day. My mother would brush each curl around her fingers the following morning, blossoming each daughter into curly manifestations of girlhood. Add four matching gingham dresses with black velvet ribbon trim, white gloves, and pla excuse me, black patent leather shoes. I was five, and it was 1960. My mother had control over my hair from the moment I was born. <laughs> As I got older, I'd try to influence the line of demarcation between what she wanted and what I wanted. How long down my back, straight or curly, long or short bangs, side part or in the middle? Mom would allow small concessions, giving us choices on what to put in our hair or how to wear our hair to school. But when it came to Sundays or special occasions, there was no doubt in our minds who was in charge. Even though my father did not enter into these conversations, it was blatantly apparent from his own Elvis Presley flip, substantial burns, and the forest growing on his legs Dad was the main source of the bountiful hair gene. <laughs> it was too early in my own development to feel the trepidation that would come later when I realized his genes were my genes, and unless I wanted to wear genes for the rest of my life, <laughs> there was going to have to be some major reconstruction happening in my future. I was perfectly willing to consider wearing jeans over my black, lush forest of manly leg hair for the rest of my life. But by middle school, there was the other hair to consider. No, not down there, higher. Yes, there was equally dark, non-feminine hair that had sprouted up on my delicate arms overnight, but even that hair, I could tolerate. The girls in my sixth grade class with their baby fine, white, yellow, so fresh and so clean body hair, budding breasts and shapely athletic arms, started wearing A-line dresses with scoop necks, flouncy skirts with sleeveless tops, and strappy, stylish shoes with fishnet stockings. Maybe I was just reacting to peer pressure since there was no chance in hell I was ever going to be as bristle-free as they were. There had, there had already been one occasion where one of them had noticed the thick blanket of hair on my arms and said, geez, is your dad a monkey? <laughs> or the time at recess when they compared my ropey brunette leg hair to their almost non-existent hair. The thing is, peer pressure is called peer pressure because it will squeeze you into conformity until your eyeballs pop out and all good sense vanishes. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I was invited to Sally Long's 12th birthday tea party and all the girls had agreed to wear short summer dresses. By this time, my hair insecurity had grown to such a frenzy I was convinced that my friends didn't really want me at the party at all. The invitation could be part of a big conspiracy to somehow further humiliate me. I became paranoid, downright schizophrenic. I was sure that Sally's mom was in on it too. 
She had no choice. Her mom owned the merry-go-round at Balboa Park, and I'd recently been granted an entire day's worth of rides so that Mrs. Long could trade for the latest pair of naturalizer heels at my dad's shoe store. Hair had become the root of all my insecurities. I knew what I had to do. I begged my mom to take me shopping for a sleeveless summer dress. And much to my surprise, she was happy that I was taking what she saw as the first step towards embracing my womanhood, which for her was about my femininity, and for me was about my popularity. We left for our shopping trip Saturday morning, the day of the party, and after many stores, there it was at JCPenney. A navy blue dress with a red and white polka dot cotton ruffle around the bottom. Sleeveless. The sandals were easy. My father loved to provide the latest styles to advertise the new summer merchandise. White, oh baby, fishnets completed the ensemble. We bought Sally a gift and rushed home to print for the afternoon party, now only an hour away. Before getting in the shower, I begged my mother to let me shave my legs. All the girls are doing it, and they don't even need to. I have a black forest. It will be humiliating. Your legs will be covered. Don't be silly. Your friends won't even notice. They will notice. Girls notice everything. <sighs> She tried to appease me by promising to put a bun in my hair, quite the current rage. I grudgingly agreed and prayed everyone would not look below my cute bun and my sleek new dress. It came time to slip my God bless America red, white, and blue creation over my head, and I lifted my arms in front of the vanity mirror in my bedroom. The dress settled over my new slightly padded bra, and my eyes met the mirror arms still in the air as I allowed the dress to slink into place. I watched my expectant eyeballs go from hope to horror. Oh, God, no! Growing in both scary armpits like twin tarantulas were repulsive shocks of dark, tangled, longer-than-life hair. I clamped my arms to my sides where I would vow, I vowed they would stay for the rest of my life. <laughs> With only 20 minutes until party time, I pulled my mother into the bathroom, shut the door, and lifted my arms. I saw the, oh shit, look in her eyes. <laughs> Before she even realized that she could not, in good conscience, deny my request. <laughs> you can't let me go like this, Mom. Nobody else has trees growing under their arms like I do. My mother tried to resist, but only briefly. My pleading eyes matched with, truly, the horrendous sight of my pits convinced her it was time. I slipped off the dress and with a combination of scissors, my father's super axle hacker, and my mother's razor, we landscaped my pits. <laughs> with my armpits slick and shiny, as smooth as a baby's bottom, we slipped that dress back in place and with my leg hairs blowing in the breeze between each triangle of my white fishnet stockings, <laughs> I was off to the party. <laughs> I should be able to tell you now what happened at that party, but to be honest, I don't remember much about the actual party and the would-be judges of my hairiness or lack thereof. I guess everything went as smooth as an awkward party of girls in the thick of puberty can go. I don't remember anyone noticing my comely, glabrous armpits or scraggly hair legs, leg hairs. Maybe I raised my arms high to reach for a balloon just because I could. Maybe I mostly watched everyone else because that's what I've always done. Maybe someone else had a bigger problem that day that took the focus off me. What I do remember is something happened between my mother and I that day that changed everything. It was a moment born of my hysterical need where my mother released some of her control over my hair. Somewhere in her look, I'd seen my hair flash before her eyes from gentle swells to banana curls to trees sprouting from the armpit that is puberty. In the end, this memory is not that different from my first hair memory. 
Instead of a photograph masquerading as a reminiscence, this pivotal moment has become a snapshot in my mind. In both instances, my mother simply loved me and cared about my hair. When it was the right time, she gave me the rights to that which she always knew would be mine. Thank you. Give it up for Vamp first timer Nancy Johnson. <laughs>